Despite lobbying by doctors, manufacturers, and the public, the Food and Drug Administration has not approved any new ingredients for sunscreens in nearly nine years. That's in part because the process for authorizing over-the-counter products is slower and less flexible than the process for approving new drugs. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Joshua Sharfstein, Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Sharfstein has written a perspective article about the regulation of sunscreen products in the United States. Dr. Sharfstein, you were at one time the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the FDA. How did you view the process for authorizing over-the-counter products, such as sunscreen ingredients, then, and has your take on it changed since you left the agency? I've always seen the process of over-the-counter product regulation as much more difficult and time-consuming than the usual approval process for prescription drugs. It is really important to realize the difference between how over-the-counter products are regulated and prescription drugs. For prescription drugs, people do an application, and the FDA gets to make a decision on the individual product. And there are negotiations that happen. The data gets reviewed. If the product is approved, then the FDA can require that safety data is collected and then can take action based on that data after approval. For the -the over-the-counter products, though, it's not exactly like that. It's actually more like the agency has to do a regulation using the usual time period for regulation, public comment. Every single word matters. Basically, the label for an over-the-counter drug is established through a public process rather than set by the FDA through a approval process. So it's just a completely different take, and it basically means that It's very inflexible, it takes longer, and then once an over-the-counter product is approved or set of products is approved, then anyone can make it, it's not just the company, and it is very hard for the agency to acquire safety data and take action. So people don't realize that it's one agency, but two totally different approaches to allowing products to be sold. Despite everything that's known about the causes of skin cancer, you note in your article that melanoma rates have continued to rise. How much would having a broader array of sunscreen products affect that trend? And how much is it behaviors such as indoor tanning that are the problem? I definitely think indoor tanning is a problem. I think that it causes cancer, according to American Academy of Pediatrics and many others. It also is increasingly popular, particularly among young people. So I think that it is a problem. And you see states banning kids from doing indoor tanning and trying to provide some public health messaging around it. In addition, you have the fact that people go outside deliberately to try to get tans, as well as just go outside during hot days without wearing sunscreen. And so you have, I think, both issues. The question of whether new sunscreen ingredients would make a difference, I have not found really strong evidence on that point. I think it is very much a hope by people who advocate for fewer cases of melanoma, that some more flexibility around the ingredients, longer lasting ingredients would have an effect on reducing melanoma. I don't think that that has been firmly established, but the fact that not that many people wear sunscreens and the fact that it does have to be applied frequently, certainly it's plausible that with different ingredients that were more friendly to consumers that it would be worn more. In what ways then are the newer sunscreen ingredients, the ones that are widely used in Europe, preferable to the oxybenzone and avabenzone that are most used in the U.S.? I think that the theory behind that is that they last longer, don't have to be applied as frequently, at least some of those ingredients. Perhaps they're more water-resistant, those sorts of things. But again, I'm not seeing in this kind of discussion a very clear explanation of the public health benefits that would be gained. And I think that's an important point because the agency is in a difficult position with these products. On the one hand, there's potential benefit, although I don't think it may be as documented as maybe some of the advocates would say. And then on the other hand, there are new ingredients and there's potential risk. And at the same time, the agency's stuck right now with this over-the-counter process where if they make it available, it's very widely available and there's not a lot of flexibility for the agency to undo what an approval would look like. So it's a combination of unclear benefits and not a lot of flexibility to handle risk makes it very hard for the agency to move on these products. And as you said earlier, the process for new rules about over-the-counter products can take years, even decades. And once something's approved, it's difficult for the FDA to address any safety issues afterward. 
Yeah, it's useful to understand why that's the case. These over-the-counter rules were really established for things that are, quote, generally recognized as safe and effective. They're not really supposed to be for innovative products. It's like products that have been out there for a long, 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 long time. And this is how your basic over-the-counter medicines didn't have to go back through the approval process after the major food and drug laws of the 20th century were passed is that they have the standard of generally recognized as safe and effective. That's not a standard that works really well for innovative products because they may not really have that much experience and they may pose novel safety questions. And it's just as like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, I think, to try to pressure the agency into approving a whole bunch of new things under a pathway that's very slow, very rigid, and really designed for things where there are no questions at all. You talk in your article about the Sunscreen Innovation Act, which was signed at the end of last year. It didn't spur the FDA to approve any new ingredients. What then are the limitations of that law? Well, I think that the basic approach of that law was to pressure the FDA to put out decisions under the -the over-the-counter authority that it has to approve some of the new ingredients, and FDA did not do that. I think that The law didn't really give any more flexibility, any significantly greater flexibility to the agency. And the agency, based on advice that it got from an advisory committee, believes that there are some important unanswered scientific questions. So you really have a standoff. You have people who are really pushing for the new ingredients. On the other hand, you have the agency saying, look, these are products that will be worn by millions of people who are not sick, don't have melanoma, and we want to have some degree of assurance of safety and We're stuck with this approval process that's very rigid and doesn't give us a lot of flexibility to change our mind later. So it's really, I think, not a great situation where people are essentially trying to get FDA to put a square peg into a round hole rather than helping the FDA readjust the ways that it can review products like this. So final question. You argue that Congress should establish an approval pathway that combines the flexibility of the new drug pathway with the ability to simultaneously approve multiple formulations of an over-the-counter product. How feasible is that sort of legislation? Do you think that could pass anytime soon? Well, what was pretty impressive is that the advocates and the coalition did a very good job of getting Congress's attention to the problem of melanoma and the need for additional ingredients and different products available for consumers. And I've spoken to a number of people in that coalition, including... Wendy Selig, who testified before Congress, and that's a pretty savvy group. And I think that they were able to get a lot of attention to an important public health problem. And I think that my goal for them would be for them to take a look at the FDA's authority and say, let's make it easier for the FDA to do what we're hoping that they will do. And the way to do that is to give the agency more flexibility in handling products like this, not to just kind of pressure FDA to use a process that really is not intended for this kind of innovation. I think that it is possible. Ordinarily, you would say it's so hard to get Congress to pass things, but this is a coalition that has proven that it can do that. And I think that if it's able to do that, it could have positive benefits, not just for the regulation of sunscreen and new sunscreen ingredients, but actually for over-the-counter regulation in general. Thank you, Dr. Sharfstein.